they were. Iolanthe was the life and soul of Fairyland. Why, she wrote all our songs and arranged all our dances. We sing her songs and we trip her measures, but we don't enjoy ourselves. <sighs> to think that five and twenty years have elapsed since she was banished. What could she have done to deserve so terrible a punishment? Something awful. She married a mortal. <gasps> Is it injudicious to marry a mortal? Injudicious? It strikes at the root of the whole fairy system. By our laws, the fairy who marries a mortal dies. But Tylanthe didn't die. No. Because your queen, who loved her with a surpassing love, commuted her sentence to penal servitude for life on condition that she left her husband and never communicated with him again. That sentence of penal servitude, she is now serving out on her head at the bottom of that stream. Yes, but when I banished her, I gave her all the pleasant places of the earth to dwell in. I am sure I never intended that she should go and live at the bottom of a stream. It makes me perfectly wretched to think of the discomfort she must have undergone. Think of the damp, and her chest was always delicate. And the frogs. Oh! I never shall enjoy any peace of mind until I know why I and we went to live among the frogs. Then why not come up here and ask her? Why? Because I should forgive her at once. Then why not forgive her? Twenty-five years, it's a long time. Think of how we loved her. Loved her? What was your love to mine? Why, she was invaluable to me. Who taught me to curl myself inside a buttercup? I, Ananthe. <laughs> Who taught me to sweep upon a cobweb? I, Ananthe. Who taught me to dive into a dewdrop, to nestle in a nutshell, to gamble upon gossamer? I, Ananthe. Well, she certainly did surprising things. <laughs> oh, give it back to us, great queen. For your sake, if not for ours. Oh, I should be strong, but I am weak. I should be marble, but I am clay. Her punishment has been heavier than I intended. I did not mean that she should go and live among the frogs, and, well, well, it shall be as you wish. It shall be as you wish. 
I left my husband by your royal command, but he does not even know of his father's existence. How old is he? Twenty-four. <gasps> Twenty-four? No one would think to look at you you had a son of twenty-four. But that's the advantage of being immortal. We never grow old. Hmm. Is he pretty? He's extremely pretty, but he's inclined to be stout. I see no objection to stoutness <laughs> in moderation. And what is he? He's an Arcadian shepherd, and he loves Phyllis, a ward in chancery. A mere shepherd? And he but half a fairy? He's a fairy down to the waist, but his legs are mortal. Dear me. I have no 
no reason to suppose that I am more curious than other people. But I confess, I should like to see a person who is a fairy down to the waist, but whose legs are mortal. Nothing easier, for here he comes. <laughs> Good mother, good mother, good morrow. By some means or other, pray banish your sorrow. With joy beyond telling, my bosom is swelling. So join in a measured express of all flesh. For I'm to be married today, today. Yes, I'm to be married today. Yes, he's to be married today, today. Yes, he's to be married today. Then the Lord Chancellor has at last given his consent to your marriage with his beautiful ward, Phyllis. Not he, indeed. To all my tearful prayers, he answers me. A shepherd lad is no fit housemate for a ward of chancery. I stood in court, and there I sang him songs of Arcady with flagellate accompaniment. In vain. At first he seemed amused, so did the bar, but quickly wearying of my pipe and song, bade me get out. A servile usher then in crumpled bands and rusty bombazine led me, still singing, into chancery lane. Oh, go no more, I'll marry her today and braid the upshot, be it what it may. But... Who are these? Oh, Strephon, rejoice with me. My queen has pardoned me. Pardoned you, mother? Oh, this is good news indeed. And these ladies are my beloved sisters. Your sisters? Then they are... my aunts. <laughs> A pleasant piece of news for your bride on her wedding day. Hush! My bride knows nothing of my fairyhood. I dare not tell her, lest it frighten her. She thinks me mortal and prefers me so. Your fairyhood doesn't seem to have done you much good. Much good? My dear aunt, it's the curse of my existence. What's the use of being half a fairy? My body can creep through a keyhole, but what's the good of that when my legs are left kicking behind? I can make myself invisible down to the waist, but that's of no use when my legs remain exposed to view. My brain is a fairy brain, but from the waist downwards, I'm a gibbering idiot. My upper half is immortal, my lower half grows older every day, and some day or other must die of old age. What's to become of my upper half? When I've buried my lower half? Oh, I really don't know. Poor fellow. I see your difficulty. But with a fairy brain, you should seek an intellectual sphere of action. Let me see. I've a borough or two at my disposal. Would you like to go into Parliament? A fairy member? That would be delightful. I'm afraid I should do no good there. You see, down to the waist, I'm a Tory of the most determined description, but my legs are a couple of confounded radicals, and on a division, they're sure to lead me into the wrong lobby. You see, they're two to one, which is a strong working majority. <laughs> Don't let that distress you. You shall be returned as a liberal conservative. And your legs shall be our peculiar care. I see your majesty does not do things by halves. No, we are fairies down to the feet.
thee discover, steal, purchase, or borrow some means of concealing the care you are feeling and joy in the measure expressive of pleasure. For we're to be married today, today. Yes, we're to be married today. Yes, we're to be married today, today. Yes, we're to be married today. Phyllis, and today we are to be made happy forever. Well, we're to be married. It's the same thing. Oh, I suppose it is. But, oh, Strephon, I tremble at the step I'm taking. I believe it's penal servitude for life to marry a ward of court without the Lord Chancellor's consent. I shall be of age in two years. Don't you think you could wait two years? Two years? Have you ever looked in the glass? No, never. Here, look at that, and tell me if you think it rational to expect me to wait two years. No, you're quite right. It is asking too much. One must be reasonable. Besides, who knows what will happen in two years? Why, you might fall in love with the Lord Chancellor himself by that time. Yes, he's a clean old gentleman. As it is, half the House of Lords are sighing at your feet. The House of Lords are certainly extremely attentive. Attentive? I should think they were. Why do five and twenty liberal peers come down to shoot over your grass plot last autumn? Don't tell me it was the sparrows. Why did five and twenty conservative peers come down to fish your pond? Don't tell me it was the goldfish. No, no, delays are dangerous. If we are to marry, the sooner the better.
true embodiment of everything that's excellent. It has no kind of fault or flaw, and I, my lords, embody the law. The constitutional guardian eye of pretty young wards in Chancery. All very agreeable girls and none are over the age of 21. <laughs> A pleasant occupation for a rather susceptible chancellor. A pleasant occupation for a rather susceptible chancellor. But though the compliment implied inflates me with legitimate pride, it nevertheless can't be denied that it has its inconvenient side. But I'm not so old and I'm not so plain and I'm quite prepared to marry again. For there'd be the deuce to pay in the lords if I fell in love with one of me wards. Which rather tries my temper for I'm such a susceptible chancellor. Which rather tries his temper for he's such a susceptible chancellor. One who'd marry a ward must come to me for my accord, and in my court I sit all day, giving agreeable girls away. With one for him, and one for he, and one for you, and one for ye, and one for thou, and one for thee, but never, oh never, a one for me. Which is exasperating for a highly susceptible chancellor. Which is exasperating for a highly susceptible chancellor. And now, my lords, to the business of the day. By all means, Phyllis, who is a ward of court, has so powerfully affected your lordship that you have appealed to me in a body to give her to whichever one of you she may think proper to select. Yet a noble lord has just gone to her cottage to request her immediate attendance. It would be idle to deny that I myself have the misfortune to be singularly attracted by this young person. My regard for her is rapidly undermining my constitution. Three months ago, I was a stout man. I need say no more. If I could reconcile it with my duty, I should unhesitatingly award her to myself, for I can conscientiously say I know no man so well fitted to render her exceptionally happy. Yeah, yeah. But such an award would be open to misconstruction. And so at whatever personal inconvenience, I waive my claim. Oh, my lord. I desire on the part of this house to express its sincere sympathy with your lordship's most painful position. No, I thank your lordships. The feelings of a lord chancellor who is in love with a ward of court are not to be envied. I mean, what is his position? Can he give his own consent to his own marriage with his own ward? Can he marry his own ward without his own consent? And if he marry his own ward without his own consent, can he commit himself for contempt of his own court? And if he commit himself for contempt of his own court, can he appear by counsel before himself to move for a rest of his own judgment? Ah, my lords, it is indeed painful to have to sit upon a wool sack which is stuffed with such thorns as these. <coughs> uh, my lords, uh, I have much pleasure in announcing that I have succeeded in inducing the young person to present herself at the bar of this house.
the richest and rarest, her origin's lonely, it's true. To the birth and position I plenty, I've grammar and spelling for two, and blood and devotion for twenty.
the bitter pain of stern denials, nor with the bond disdain augment our trials. Hearts just as pure and fair may beat in Belgrave Square as in the lovely air of seven dials. Chancery, I go by nature's acts of parliament. The bees, the breeze, the seas, the rooks, the brooks, the gales, the vales, the fountains, and the mountains cry, you love this maiden, take her, we command you. Tis written heaven by the bright barbed dart that leaps forth into lurid light from each grim thundercloud. 
the very rain pours forth her sad and sodden sympathy. When chorus nature bids me take my love, shall I reply, nay, but a certain Lord Chancellor forbids it? Sir, you are England's Lord High Chancellor, but are you Chancellor of birds and trees, King of the winds and Prince of thunderclouds? No. <laughs> it's a nice point. I don't know that I ever met it before. But, but my difficulty is that at present, there is no evidence before the court that Chorus Nature has interested herself in the matter. No evidence? You have my word for it. I tell you that she bade me take my love. But my good sir, you mustn't tell us what she told you. It's not evidence. Now, an affidavit from a thunderstorm or a few words on oak from a heavy shower would meet with all the attention they deserve. And have you the heart to apply the prosaic rules of evidence to a case which bubbles over with poetical emotion? Distinctly. I have always kept my duty strictly before my eyes, and it is to that fact that I owe my advancement to my present distinguished position. <laughs> When I went to the bar as a very young man, said I to myself, said I, I'll work on a new and original plan, said I to myself, said I, I'll never assume that a rogue or a thief is a gentleman worthy implicit belief, because his attorney has sent me a brief, said I to myself, said I. I go into court, I will read my brief through, said I to myself, said I, and I'll never take work I'm unable to do, said I to myself, said I, my learned profession I'll never disgrace by taking a fee with a grin on my face when I haven't been there to attend to the case, said I to myself, said I. I'll never throw dust in a juryman's eye, said I to myself, said I. Or hoodwink a judge who is not overwise, said I to myself, said I. Or assume that the witness is summoned in course, and exchequer queen's bench common pleas or divorce, and perjure themselves as a matter of course, said I to myself, said I. In other professions in which men engage, said I to myself, said I, and the army, and the navy, the church, and the state, said I to myself, said I, professional license if carried too far, your chance of promotion will certainly mar, and I fancy the rule might apply to the bar, said I to myself, said I. between us and the Lord Chancellor has separated us forever. The Lord Chancellor? Oh, if he did but know. If he did but know what? No matter. The Lord Chancellor has no power over you. Remember, you are half a fairy. You can defy him down to the waist. Yes, but from the waist downwards he can commit me to prison for years. Of what avail is it that my body is free if my legs are working out seven years penal servitude? True, but take heart. Our Queen has promised you her special protection. I'll go to her and lay your peculiar case before her. Oh, my beloved mother, how can I repay the debt I owe you? darkly looms the day and all is dull and grey 
to chase the gloom away on thee I'll call. What was that? I think I heard him say that on a rainy day to while the time away on her he'd call. We think we heard him say that on a rainy day to while the time away on her wrecked your bark and all is drear and dark if thou shouldst need an ark I'll give thee one what was that? I heard the minx remark should meet him after dark inside St. James's Park and give him one we heard the minx remark should meet him after dark Inside St. James's Park and give him one. The prospect's not so bad. My heart's so sore and sad. And we'll very soon be glad as summer's sun. Oh, when the sky is dark and tempest wreck is dark, if he should need an auction, give him one. I pray and be careful what you say as the ancient woman said this time Lente for I really do not see how so young a girl could be the mother of a man of five and twenty <laughs> My lord of evidence I have no doubt she is has been my mother from my birth in babyhood upon her lap i lay with the infant food she moistened my clay had she withheld the succor she supplied by hunger quelled your strife on might have died had that refreshment been denied, he did ask Trefon might have died. Had that refreshment been denied, indeed our Trefon might have died. But as she's not his mother, it appears why we his heart and By what laws should we so joyously rejoice because our Strephon did not die? Oh, rather let us pipe our eyes. Because our Strephon did not die. That's very true, that 
The lady of my love has caught me talking to another. Oh, I am Shrekham is a rogue. I tell her very plainly that the lady is my mother. Tell her diddle, tell her diddle, Tom Bombay. She won't believe my statement and declares we must be parted because on our career of double dealing I have started. Then gives her hand to one of these and neatly broken hearted. Tell her diddle, tell her diddle, Tom Bombay. A cruel one so separate to lovers from each other. Oh, I am Shrekham's a rogue. Done him an injustice for the lady is his mother. Tell him, tell him, tell him, tell him, tell him. The 
that fable perhaps may serve his turn as well as any other. I didn't see her face, but if they fondle one another, and she's but 17, I don't believe it was his mother. Tattle-diddle, tattle-diddle. <laughs> I have often had a use for a thoroughbred excuse on a sudden, which is English for a pente. But of all I ever heard, this is much the most absurd. For she's 17 and he is 5 and 20. For she is 17 and he is only 5 and 20. Oh, my, a simple is a move. Now listen patiently, for this paradox will be telling nobody at all or any gente. Her age upon the date, Tommy's birth was minus 8. If she's 17 and he is 5 and 20. Shocking taste. It is rude, madam, to intrude, madam, with your brood, madam, brazen face. You come here, madam, interfere, madam, with a peer, madam, I am one. You're aware, madam, what you dare, madam, so take care, madam, and be gone. Let us stay, madam, I should say, madam, let us play, madam, shocking taste. It is rude, madam, to elude, madam, with your brood, madam, brazen face. We don't bear, madam, any taste, madam, with your brood, madam, brazen face. Madam, you don't bear, madam, any taste, madam, with your In my armory of wonders. Tremendous. <laughs> 
chap remains on sentry go to chase monotony. He exercises all his brains that he is assuming that he's got any. Oh, never nurtured in the laptop luxury, yet I admonish you. I am an intellectual chap and think of things that would astonish you. I often think it's comical, fa la la, fa la la, how nature always does contrive, fa la la la, that every boy and every gal that's born into the world alive is either a little liberal or else a little conservative. Fa la la, fa la la, is either a little liberal or else a little conservative. Fa la la. House MPs divide if they've a brain and cerebellum too. They've got to leave that brain outside and vote just as their leaders tell them to. But then the prospect of a lot of dull MPs in close proximity, all thinking for themselves is what no man can face with equanimity. Then let's rejoice with love, fa la, fa la la, fa la la, that nature always does contrive, fa la la la. That every boy and every gal that's born into the world alive is either a little liberal or else a little conservative. Fa la la, fa la la, is either a little liberal. Or else a little conservative. Fa la la.
Annoyed, I should think, sir. That this ridiculous protege of yours is playing the deuce with everything. Tonight is the second reading of his bill to throw the peerage open to competitive examination. Who will him carry it to? Carry it? Of course he will. He's a parliamentary pickford. He carries everything. Yes, if you please. That's our fault. The deuce it is. Yes. We influence the members and compel them to vote just as he wishes them to. It's our system. It shortens the debates. Well, think what it all means, then. I don't so much mind for myself, but with a house of peers with no grandfathers worth mentioning, the country must go to the dogs. I suppose it must. I don't want to say a word against brains. I, I have a great respect for brains. Often wish I had some myself. <laughs> With the House of Peers, composed exclusively of people of intellect, what's to become of the House of Commons? I never thought of that. This comes of women interfering in politics. Yes. It so happens that if there is an institution in Great Britain which is not susceptible of any improvement at all, it is the House of Peers. <laughs> And really roll the waves in a good Queen of Esther's time. A house of peers made no pretense to intellectual eminence or scholarship sublime. Yet a Briton won her proudest place in a good Queen of Esther's glorious days. Yet Briton won her proudest place in a good Queen of Esther's glorious days. Yes, Briton won her proudest days. Distinct 
but self-contained dignity combined with airy condescension. Give me a British representative peer. Then pray stop this protege of yours before it's too late. Think of the mischief you are doing. But we can't stop him now. Aren't they lovely? <laughs> oh, why did you go and defy us, you great geese? <laughs> In vain to us you plead, don't go. Your prayers we do not heed, don't go. It's true we sigh, but don't suppose a tearful eye forgiveness shows. Oh no, we're very cross indeed. Yes, very cross. Don't go. Disrespectful sneers, ha ha, call forth indignant tears, ha ha, if that's the case, my dears. Don't go. We'll go.
noble men at once. That ought to be enough to make any girl happy. But I'm miserable. Don't suppose it's because I care for Strephon, for I hate him. No girl could care for a man who goes about with a mother considerably younger than himself. Fitz, my own. Don't! How dare you! Perhaps you are the nobleman I'm engaged to. Well, I am one of them. But how came you to have a peerage? Well, it's a, a prize for being born first. A kind of Derby Cup? Not at all. I, I come of a very old and distinguished family. And you are proud of your race. But of course you are. You won it. But why are people made peers? The principle is not easy to explain. I'll give you an example. De Belleville. De Belleville was regarded as a Crichton of his age. His tragedies were reckoned much too thoughtful for the stage. His poems held a noble rank, although it's very true that, being very proper, they were read by very few. He was a famous painter, too, and shone upon the line. And even Mr. Ruskin came and worshipped at his shrine. But alas, the school he followed was heroically high, the kind of art men rave about, but very seldom buy. And everybody said, how can he be repaid, this very great, this very good, this very gifted man? But nobody could hit upon a practicable plan. He was a great inventor, and discovered all alone a way of making everybody's fortune but his own. For in business, an inventor's little better than a fool, and my highly gifted friend was no exception to the rule. His poems, people read them in the sixpenny reviews. His, his pictures, they engraved them in the illustrated news. His inventions, they perhaps might have enriched him by degrees, but all his little income went in patent office fees. So everybody said, how can he be repaid? This very great, this very good, this very gifted man. But nobody could hit upon a practicable plan. At last, the, the point was given up in absolute despair when a distant cousin died and he became a millionaire. With a county seat in parliament, a moor or two of grouse, and a taste for making inconvenient speeches in the house. Then, government conferred on him the highest of rewards. They took him from the commons, and they put him in the lords. <laughs> and who so fit to sit in it? Deny it if you can. But this very great, this very good, this very gifted man, Although I'm more than half afraid that it sometimes may be said that we never should have reveled in that source of proper pride, however great his merits, if his cousin hadn't died. <laughs> Phyllis! My darling! He is the other. <laughs> well, have you settled which it's to be? Oh, not altogether. It's a difficult position. It would be hardly delicate to toss up. On the whole, we'd rather leave it to you. It can't possibly concern me. You are both earls, and you are both rich, and you are both plain. Oh, well, so I am. <laughs> well, I, I think that. And so am I. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I am indeed very plain. Oh, well, well, perhaps you are. There's really nothing to choose between you. If one of you would forego his title and distribute his estates among his Irish tenantry, why then I should see a reason for accepting the other. Oh, oh Lola, are you prepared to make this sacrifice? No. Not even to oblige a lady? No. Well, then the only question is, which of us should give way to the other? Perhaps she'd be happier with me. I, I don't know, I may be wrong. No, I don't know that you are. I really think she would. But the painful part of the thing is that if you rob me of the girl of my heart, one of us must die. The Tololas have invariably destroyed their successful rivals, so 
family tradition that I've sworn to respect. <clears throat> did you swear it before a commissioner? I did, on affidavit. Uh, I don't see how you can help yourself. Oh, it's a painful position, for I have a very strong regard for you, George. My dear Thomas. It's, it's a difficult position. I really don't know what I can do. Well, then, my, my, my dear Thomas, you, 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 you must not do anything. No, no. I, I say it again and again. Um, if one of us is to destroy the other, let it be me. No, no. Ah, yes, by our boyish friendship, I implore you. Well, well, be it so. No, no, I cannot consent to an act that would crush you without availing remorse. But it would not do so. Oh, I should be very sad at first. Who would not be? But it would wear off. I like you very much, but not perhaps as much as you like me. <laughs> George, you're a noble fellow, but that telltale tear betrays you. No, George, you are very fond of me, and I cannot consent to give you a week's uneasiness on my account. But it would not last a week. Remember, you leave the House of Lords. On your demise, I shall take your place. Oh, Thomas, it would not last a day. Now, I do hope you're not going to fight about me, because it's really not worthwhile. Well, I don't believe it is. Nor I. The sacred ties of friendship are paramount. No consideration shall induce me to raise a hand against Thomas. And in my eyes, the life of George is more sacred than love itself. Oh, perhaps I may incur your blame. The things of you I would not do in a friendship's name. And I may say I think the same. Not even love should rank above true friendship's name. Unrequited robs me of my rest. Love, hopeless love, my ardent soul encumbers. Love, nightmare like, lies heavy on me chest and weaves itself into my midnight slumber. <laughs> Thank you. 
When you're lying awake with a dismal headache and reposes to boot by anxiety, I conceive you may use any language you choose to indulge in without impropriety. For your brain is on fire, the bedclothes conspire with usual slumber to plunder you. First your counterpane goes and uncovers your toes and your sheet slips demurely from under you. Then the blanketing tickles you feel like mixed pickles so terribly sharp it's a pricking. And you're hot and you're cross and you tumble and toss till there's nothing twixt you and the ticking. Then the bedclothes all creep to the ground in a heap and you pick them all up in a tangle. Next your pillow resigns and politely declines to remain at its usual angle. Well, you get some repose in the form of a doze with hot eyeballs and head ever aching. But you're slumbering teams with such horrible dreams that you'd very much better be waking. For you dream you are crossing the channel and tossing about in a steamer from Haddock, which is something between a large bathing machine and a very small second-class carriage. And you're giving a treat, penny ice and cold meat, to a party of friends and relations. They're a ravenous horde, and they all came on board at Sloan Square and South Kensington stations. And bound on that journey, you find your attorney who started that morning from Devon. He's a bit undersized, so you don't feel surprised when he tells you he's only 11. Well, you're driving like mad with that singular lad by the by, the ship's now a four-wheeler. And you're playing round games, and he calls you bad names when you tell him the ties pay the dealer. But this you can't stand, so you throw up your hand, and you find you're as cold as an icicle. In your shirt and your socks, the black silk with gold clocks, crossing Salisbury Plain on a bicycle. And he and the crew are on bicycles too, which they somehow or other invested in. And he's telling the tars all the particulars of a company he's interested in. It's a scheme of devices to get at low prices, or goods from cop mixers to cables, which tickle the sailors by treating retailers as though they were all vegetables. You get a good space when a plant a small tradesman first take off his boots with a boot tree, and his legs will take root in his fingers or shoot, and he'll blossom and bud like a fruit tree. From the greengrocer tree, you get grapes and green pea, cauliflower, pineapple, and cranberries, while the pastry cook plant cherry brandy will grant apple puffs, three corners, and bamberries. The shares are a penny, and ever so many are taken by Rothschild and Mary. And just as a few are allotted to you, you awake with a shattered despair. You're a regular egg with a crick in your neck and no wonder you snore for your head's on the floor and you've needles and pins from your soles to your shins. Your flesh is a creep for your left legs to sleep and you cramp in your toes and a fly on your nose. Some fluff in your lung and a feverish tongue and a thirst is intense in a general sense. You haven't been sleeping in clover. But the darkness is past and it's daylight at last and the night has been long. Ditto, ditto, my song. And thank goodness that both of them over. Distressed to see your lordship in this condition. Ah, my lord. It is seldom that a lord chancellor has reason to envy the position of another. But I am free to confess I would rather be two earls engaged to Phyllis than any other half dozen noblemen on the face of the globe. Oh, it's an enviable position when you're the only one. Oh, yes, no doubt, most enviable. At the same time, seeing you thus, we, we naturally say to ourselves, this is very sad. His, his lordship is constitutionally as blind as a bird. He, he trills upon the bench like a thing of song and gladness. His series of judgments in F sharp, given andante and in 6-8 time, are among the most remarkable effects ever produced in a court of chancery. He is perhaps the only living instance of a judge <laughs> a judge whose decrees have earned the honour of a double encore. How can we bring ourselves to do that which will deprive the Court of Chancery of one of its most attractive features? I feel the force of your remarks, yeah, but I am here in two capacities, and they clash, my lord, they clash. <coughs> I deeply grieve to say that in presuming to address myself and ask for my consent, 
I presume to address myself in terms which render it impossible for me ever to address myself again. It was a most painful scene, my lord, most painful. This is what it is to have two capacities. <laughs> come, come. Let us be thankful that we are persons of no capacity whatever. My lord, you were a very just and kindly old gentleman, and you need have no hesitation in approaching yourself. So you do so respectfully and with a proper sense of deference. Oh, do you really think so? I do. Well, I will nerve myself to another effort, and if that fails, I resign myself to my fate. <laughs> If you go in, you're sure to win. Yours will be the charming maid. Be your law, the ancient saw. Faint but never one fair lady. Never, never, never faint but never one fair lady. Every journey has an end. When at the worst affairs will mend. But the day for day is mine. Hustle your horse and don't say bye. He who shies at such a prize he is not worth a mare of baby. Be so kind to bear in mind, fate had never won a lady. Never, 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 fate had never won a lady. While the sun shines, make your hay. Where a will is, there's a way. Bear the lion in his lair. None but the brave deserve the fair. I'll take heart and make a start. Though I fear the prospect shady. Much I'd spend to gain my end.
Take a tipsy lout, gathered from the gutter. Hustle him about, strap him to a shutter. What am I but he? Washed at how his state fed on filagree, clothed and educated. He's a mark of scorn. I might be another if I had been born of a tipsy mother. Take a wretched thief through the city sneaking, pocket handkerchief ever, ever seeking. What is he but I? Robbed of all my chances, kicking pockets by force of circumstances. I might be as bad as unlucky rather if I'd only had faith and for. Lady, I have not yet been informed which title your ladyship has pleased to select. I, I haven't quite decided. You see, I have no mother to advise me. No, I have. Yes, a young mother. Not very. A couple of centuries or so. Oh, she wears well. She does. She's a fairy. I beg your pardon? Of what? I've no longer any reason to conceal the fact that she's a fairy. A fairy? Well, would account for a good many things. Then I suppose you're a fairy. Well, I'm half a fairy. Which half? The upper half, down to the waistcoat. Dear me, there's nothing to show it. Don't do that. But why didn't you tell me this before? I thought you would take a dislike to me. But as it's all off, I might as well tell you the truth. I'm only half a mortal. But I'd rather have half a mortal I do love than half a dozen I don't. Oh, I think not. Go to your half dozen. It's only two, and I hate them. Please forgive me. I don't think I ought to. Besides, all sorts of difficulties will arise, you know. My grandmother looks quite as young as my mother, and so do all my aunts. I quite understand. Whenever I see you kissing a very young lady, I shall know it's an elderly relative. You will? <laughs> oh, then, Phyllis, we will be very happy. We won't wait long. No, we might change our minds. We'll get married first. And change our minds afterwards. That's the usual course. <laughs> We're weak enough to tarry ere we marry you and I. Of the feeling I inspire, you may tire by and by. Four peers with flowing coffers press their offers, that is why. I am sure we should not tarry ere we marry you and I. We're weak enough to tarry ere we marry you and I.
welcomes her daughter-in-law. She kisses just like other people. But the Lord Chancellor. I forgot him. Mother, none can resist your fairy eloquence. You will go to him and plead for us? No, no, impossible. But our happiness, our very lives depend upon our obtaining his consent. Oh, madam, you cannot refuse to do this. You know not what you ask. The Lord Chancellor is my husband. Your, your husband? husband? My husband and your father. <laughs> then our course is plain. On his learning that Strephon is his son, all objection to our marriage will be at once removed. No, he must never know. He believes me to have died childless, and dearly as I love him, I am bound under penalty of death not to undeceive him. But see, he comes. Quick, my veil. Victory, victory! Success has crowned my efforts, and I may consider myself engaged to Phyllis. At first, I wouldn't hear of it. It was out of the question. But I took heart. I pointed out to myself that I was no stranger to myself that in point of fact I had been acquainted with myself for some years. This had its effect. I then confessed that I had watched my professional advancement with considerable interest, and I handsomely added that I yielded to no one in admiration for my private and professional virtues. This was a great point gained. And I then endeavoured to work upon my feelings, conceive my joy when I distinctly perceived a tear glistening in my own eye. Eventually, after a severe struggle with myself, I reluctantly, most reluctantly, consented. <laughs> my lord, a suppliant at your feet I kneel. It may not be, for so the fates decide. Learn thou that Phyllis is my promised bride. <laughs>
shall be so. Those who would separate us themselves. It seems they have helped themselves. <laughs> and pretty freely, too. You have all incurred death. But I can't slaughter the whole company, and yet the law is clear. Every fairy must die who marries a mortal. Allow me, as an old equity draftsman, to make a suggestion. The subtleties of the legal mind are equal to the emergency. The other thing is really quite simple. The insertion of a single word will do it. Let it stand that every fairy shall die who don't marry a mortal. And there you are, out of your difficulty at once. We like your humour <laughs> very well. Private Willis. Mom? <laughs> To save my life, it is necessary that I marry at once. How should you like to be a fairy guardsman? Well, ma'am, I don't think much of the British soldier who wouldn't ill convenience himself to save a female in distress. You are a brave fellow. You're a fairy from this moment. <laughs> Lords, how say you? Will you join our ranks? Well, 
Now that the peers are to be recruited entirely from persons of intelligence, I don't see what use we are down here. Do you, Tololo? <laughs> None whatever. Good. <laughs> then away we go to Fairyland. <laughs>